Thanks. Thanks, Ron. <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll ask you to bear with me today. I don't claim to be an accomplished public speaker, and I guess I've been thrust into a role that <clears throat> I wouldn't assume of my own choosing. And if I thought there was an alternative, I wouldn't even be here. Um, most of the information I want to tell you today I haven't compiled. It's in my head. Sometimes it comes out a little disjointed, but anyway, we'll get there in the end. I guess, um, thanks Ron for inviting me today to tell our story. Um, up until recently, I, and it'd be no exaggeration that all of my community would probably have been in the same position that we didn't know what Property Rights Australia was. We had no interest in it. We had no need to have an interest. Um, we were happily farming on the floodplain, east of Cecil Plains and on the Condamine floodplain. We had no veg management issues. Um, it's a treeless plain, and it might have amused you to know how many people make comment about us guys clearing all the trees out there <laughs> when they come out for the first time. But it, it is a natural treeless floodplain. It never had trees, and the trees that are there have been established at great pain. So we had no cause to be concerned about property rights as such. We were happily doing all the things that farmers in our position do. We were concerned with the weather, um, floods, drought, um, hailstorms, frost, um, um, commodity prices, the exchange rate, interest rates, all of those things that <clears throat> for generations people like me have been managing and we must be doing it ses successfully because we're still there. However, out of the blue and unannounced and uninvited, about two years ago, we had a gas rig, or, or, or the drilling rig, we didn't know it was a, anything to do with gas, turn up <coughs> onto a railway reserve that joins our property. Um, <coughs> this um, drill rig was, I suppose, about 400 metres from my house. It was within 50 metres of my neighbour's irrigation bore. Um, and of course it triggered some concern in the community as to what these people were doing. Um, we live in a highly regulated environment when it comes to drilling for groundwater. We <coughs> survive uh, in our region predominantly on irrigation water from the Condamine alluvial aquifer, which is a highly regulated aquifer. Um, and if I see a drill rig on my neighbour's property, I usually know why it's there and what it is that it's doing. It would have been previously advertised in the paper for a re-drill or um, something of that nature. So this um, activity occurred unannounced. Since then, we've had to, I suppose, comprehend a whole lot of things that weren't even in our vocabulary two years ago. And we've had to come to understand things like environmental authorities, environmental management plans, environmental impact statements. Um, we weren't even aware of other tenure that was over our freehold farming property. We've had to understand what ATP means, authority to prospect, which is the tenure that my particular farming land lies in. And then there's PLAs and PLs. Um, we've had to learn quickly how we can respond to those things and where we fit in the process. And I guess it's in an understanding of that process of these regulatory instruments that govern the coal seam gas industry that has led us on a path to where we are along with 13 other farming families in our district, 
are currently challenging in the land court some conditions or lack of conditions in an environmental authority that's been issued to Arrow Energy to conduct petroleum activities in our region. Like I say, we are reluctant participants in this process. However, unless we participate in the process, decisions are being made about the environmental regulations in our region and about particular environmental attributes of our region that are essential to our businesses and our lifestyles, decisions are being made about those environmental attributes that we have no input into and no say over. And we found that unacceptable and felt that as responsible custodians of the land and of the environment that surrounds it in our region, we had no option but have some input and try and influence the process. I'd have to acknowledge first up the um, tremendous financial and physical and advisory support that we've received our, in our endeavour to to affect change in this process from Cotton Australia in the first instance who agreed to be our nominees to the National Farmers Federation for a funding application under the Australian Farmers Fighting Fund to um, further this um, land court challenge. We were ultimately successful in that application uh, to the Australian Farmers Fighting Fund and indeed I think we are the first case of this nature to do with coal seam gas and agriculture in Australia. So there are a lot of people watching with interest um, what actually happens. The funding agreement still poses a significant amount of challenges to us people in our region. It is a dollar for dollar funding agreement and this is no small undertaking financially that we are engaging on. <coughs> I guess I don't need to tell you about floods and the impact on agriculture in general that the seasonal conditions have inflicted on us. So. I guess there's never an easy time to do these sorts of things. Now is especially not an easy time. However, my family and the supporters we have in our community feel that um, this is an important issue and, and we need to give it our best shot. We're only going to get one chance at it, so we need to give it our best shot. It's, it's a difficult thing to, I suppose, define in real terms what we would see as a success out of this operation that we've engaged in. The environmental authority process um, is quite complex and it starts with a small ad in the public notice of your local paper. And I guess up until this happened, most of us didn't spend much time reading public notices. But earlier last year, there was two particular public notices in the Dolby Herald that um, were of great interest to us people. Um, and unless you knew what you were looking for, you could have looked over these things and not understood what they meant. They were a, a relatively small column, about three inches, um, and it mentioned a host of PLs and PLAs and ATPs, and that's authorities to prospect um, petroleum lease applications and petroleum leases. It then mentioned some codes out of the Environmental Protection Act. Um, and unless you knew what those codes stood alongside, you wouldn't have known what it is that they were applying for. Luckily, there were some very astute people in our community that did notice these ads and did engage the community and, and request that they respond. So a number of us became submitters to the process. And I guess I'd have to say that 
but I was one of those submitters and I have to say that in that submission phase and submitting on these applications I didn't fully understand what I was submitting on so I submitted in general terms about my fears in regard to the coal seam gas industry and um, and the lack of information around those fears. From, from there, a number of months went by and ultimately in October, the environmental authority was granted. We got a one pager in the mail that said basically it is granted, effective from a date in October. Um, should you um, be a dissatisfied person, you have a number of options. The first option was you could in, apply for an internal review. Um, and the second option was apply to the land court. Our community, uh, I suppose, um, was a little unsure of uh, the proper course of action. We, we had numerous conversations with the regular pre-arm of Derm, um, who granted the authority, and were a little alarmed at some of the things that we learnt there. For instance, some of the major um, environmental attributes of our region were inadequately described and inadequately defined by the proponents. And when we questioned Derm about those things um, and asked, did they ground truth these things? Have you been to this region? Have you seen the diversity over the landscape where this environmental authority applies? Some of the landscape for this environmental authority is floodplain and some of it is tree grazing country and there's a whole range in between. And the reply we got there was that um, it's too far away, we are understaffed and under-resourced, we re, um, rely on the applicants to furnish us with the information that we need to make a decision and set conditions around these things. Now, to us that was unacceptable. Wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, like I say, we work under a regulatory regime with our access to water, be it surface water or groundwater, and it is just a world apart, these two regulatory regimes. Um, we felt, given that, that we had no option but apply for an internal review, and we were very fortunate that in our community we have a very skillful woman who is able to put together those sorts of documents. Um, out of the internal review process, we did gain some ground. Derm did concede that uh, some of the issues that we raised were legitimate issues and did amend the environmental authority. However, it went nowhere near far enough, nowhere near far enough. All of this was happening over the Christmas period when we had the severe flooding events that we all experienced. Uh, and we were battling a, a timeline to get this taken further in the land court should we wish to do so. Um, ultimately, we did lodge in the land court. We were three days late in lodging because of the flooding issue. Uh, Derm and Arrow Energy, who are the respondents to our, our um, challenge, opted not to challenge that late lodgement, so we are in the land court with, with um, our um, challenge. The three particular issues that we are challenging on is first and foremost that the Environmental Authority has no conditions surrounding the condomine alluvial aquifer and I don't know how many of you understand the process of coal seam gas mining, but it does involve removing large amounts of water from the ground. Um, the industry has um, a high degree of latitude in taking that water from the ground. It's necessary to get the gas, we all understand that. Um, 
but they basically have no checks and balances in the amounts of water they can take. And whilst they're not taking it from the aquifer that is of concern to us and vital to us, the aquifer they are taking it from is interconnected to a certain degree. So we were concerned at the lack of conditioning surrounding such an important environmental asset. It's not just an irrigation supply, it's a domestic supply, it's a, it's a town water supply to towns like Dolby and Pittsworth and Mulmera. Um, so we were concerned about that aspect of it. The second thing we were concerned about was the very lax conditions surrounding the ability to rehabilitate our black soils. It's never been done before what these people are proposing to do on our soils with their hard stand areas and their road networks and their pipelines. We're not saying it can't be done, but what we're saying is before you would damage something as important as our black farming soils on the floodplain, you would need to demonstrate how are you going to rehabilitate it and what's it going to look like after you've rehabilitated it? Um, so we're, we're requesting some, I suppose, prescriptive conditions there that would give us a degree of confidence in the industry's ability to um, make good the impact on, on the soils. The third area that we were concerned about was the area of noise. Now I think possibly there is some area there that for a little give and take, but um, the reason we went with the noise challenge was um, both the company and the government have admitted um, that it would be impossible to comply with some of the noise conditions in their environmental authorities. And they have an extremely I suppose you'd call it an amount of latitude in those conditions re relating to noise. So we felt that um, they were a little vulnerable there and, and that was the reason we were challenging there. Now, it's early in the process. Um, we are struggling to um, comply with the timelines that are involved when you get into a process like this. Um, it's a huge drain on our time to, to bring the legal people up to speed about our aspects and our particular um, farming issues and the environmental issues that we're concerned about. Um, however, we've got a number of very capable people in our community that have responded remarkably to the challenge. Um, I'm not sure that I can add a whole lot more, Ron, but that's, um, I suppose, a brief outline of what we're doing and why we're doing it. I, I guess the other thing I should say in regard to coal seam gas, um, when the industry <coughs> first arrived in our region, um, we were all taken aback. We thought this was something that graziers and people west of the Condamine River had to deal with them. Um, mining would never be an issue on the black soil floodplains of the Darling Downs. And we were further taken aback by the amount of um, regulatory backing that the industry had in accessing our farms and accessing the water that lay beneath our farms. There's been a number of people in the community that have been very active in, in bringing all of those issues to the notice of people far and wide. And Drew Hutton's been mentioned, and we've got Ian Haylor here and the BSA group. Um, there's a number of individual action groups in various communities where this industry has turned up in recent years, and everybody has been active in, in bringing these issues to the fore. Has anything changed? Well, yes, it has. There's been a significant um, acknowledgement from both government and from the industry itself in the last 12 months that it couldn't continue with um, the attitude and the method of operation that it previously had. And even though it had the legislative backing and it had the government um, tacit 
support for what it was doing. It didn't have a social license and it didn't have community acceptance and it would never fly without that. So there's been a number of people that have given a lot of time that have changed that. Do we need to pull up now? No, we, we haven't anywhere near reached the stage where um, we could say that we're all happy with what this industry proposes for our, our properties. I think we've, we've turned a corner and we are going in a different direction, but I don't think it's the time to take our foot off the accelerator. Um, and I made the comment somewhere recently that until, until the two fundamental issues that I have with the industry change dramatically, I will always be on the defensive. I have no option but be on the defensive. And those two fundamental difficulties that I have with the industry is the issue of the water, first and foremost, the ability to extract or the right to extract unlimited amounts of water. Now we are making some ground on some of those issues. I chair the local irrigator group and we are in a dialogue with the company about some issues surrounding that, but it's by no means um, firm yet that, that there will be satisfaction there. The second issue is the land access issue. If the industry came to me as a private landholder in the same capacity that I am, um, then we can negotiate on equal terms. But so long as they have these compulsory access rights, I think we all need to, I suppose, stand firm. We, we, can't, we can't be seen to be giving in to that sort of access rights over our properties with all of the difficulties that surround the industry that are currently yet um, no certainty about them anyway, uh, that they, they meeting proper environmental safeguards and environmental standards. So long as that compulsory access part of the industry stands, it's a concern. And I think um, organisations like this one um, have a role to play in that regard. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Tom. We have uh, a couple of quick questions, but what, how I propose to handle this, and I think there's going to be a number of speakers that are going to follow on uh, to, to round the whole thing out, and uh, we'll have a, a, a bit of a forum, we'll have a big forum right at the end, in which we'll, we'll try and sort out with the knowledge that we've gained. But uh, our organisation has existed since we began on saying, see you in court. And that's exactly what these people are doing. And our motto is stand your ground. Now, uh, this organisation backs everything you're doing 100% because it's exactly the attitude we've taken to these kind of abuses and excesses. Now, the Vice Chairman, Lee McNichol, who you know very well, wants to ask you one question. It's a hypothetical, of course, uh, uh, Graham. Uh, <coughs> being law-abiding citizens and hard-working law-abiding citizens, uh, we would hope that the legal process that you've engaged in will come out with a just solution for the landholders and for the environment. If, it, if there isn't a just solution, in fact, we get a corrupt solution, uh, my um, response to that is I'm going to lock my gate and defend my property like uh, Paul uh, Manuel until his dying day, whatever it takes. Uh, the question I ask you is, if you are disappointed by the legal process, um, will you roll over or will you fight and lock your gate? I mean, you don't even have gates down there to lock. I don't, it's impossible for these guys to lock their gates because they don't have any fences. But uh, will you be locking your virtual gate? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Lee. Um, um, yeah, I've spent the early years of my farming life pulling down fences. <laughs> so I'm going to lock the gate. I've got to find one first. Um, 
at the entrance to all of the farming properties that my family farms and in general in our neighbourhood there's lock the gate signs. Now we <laughs> here, here. we understand um, the reality of the situation that at the end of the day it's not lawful and it's um, it's tokenism at, at the best at the moment but I, I guess it keeps it in the face of both the company and the in the community in general that we're unhappy so that's why we've put the signs up so that everybody's under no illusion that we're happy about this um, the company has said that unless it gets a large percentage of community support that it won't do what it proposes to do on our farms now um, I don't know whether to believe it or not, but they have said it publicly on a number of occasions and in a number of different forums that their aim is to attract landholder support. I'd have to admit that since they first turned up in our neighbourhood that um, there's been a, a dramatic shift of attitude from the company. And I think that's probably due to the things we're doing and the things BSA's doing and the things Drew Hutton's doing and um, all of those things are helping. I think they have realised that they can't just march onto people's properties anymore. They have to have a social licence to operate. So uh, I guess Drew, we're trying, I mean, Lee, we're trying it that way first. Um, if it gets to the stage where we have to roll over, well, we'll talk about that then. But at this stage, we're a long, long way from that. And I, I am happy that at least we do have something to talk about. They haven't just um, assumed their rights to come on and come on. So we still are talking, and that's always a good sign. Yeah. yeah I, I, yes, I think that's uh, a situation that we hope uh, will resolve itself and as I mentioned yesterday Anthony Watts when he heard what was going on in the vegetation management and that visitor from US last year at our conference said if ever there was a case for civil disobedience this is it and uh, yes sir rang me up and said I'll be down there. He said I'm six foot four or five, I'm 85 years old, I'm an old soldier. You fought for the country, your father fought for the country. Well said, sir. <laughs> hey, don't be too long. No, no, quick question. <laughs> What's happening to the water? They extract it. How are they dividing it up? Do they have a plan for a massive uh, turkey nest so you can still have access to it? Yeah, we might get around that before the day's out. Yeah. Um, 18 kilometres west of where I farm at Norwin, Arrow Energy have a current coal seam gas operation on a property called Brassdale. And any of you who go on Google Earth, just Google Brassdale and have a look at it. Um, they have been operating there for eight years at least, could be more. There are two large ring tents that they are currently evaporating water out of. Um, we all know the government has outlawed evaporation ponds and there will be a phase out period, I believe, for that. Further north of us, and people here more qualified than me to talk about it, um, Megan Baker knows more about it than I, but they have an embarrassing problem of what to do with the water and they've had to shut down wells so they, they um, have got no more storage capacity and they have some obligations to when it comes to discharging it over land that makes it very difficult for it to just discharge whenever they feel free they have to have flow regimes to discharge it to so currently there is no answer for the water however there is some talk between the industry and irrigators 
about substituting that produced calcium gas water for existing groundwater entitlement. And that would mean we would give up a megalitre of water, leave it in the ground and use a megalitre of their treated calcium gas water. That's in very simple terms. It's not quite that simple, believe me. That has merit and that definitely could work given the right circumstances. So that's, that's one of the options for the water close to where people are able to use the water. Understand that we have developed irrigation systems and storages and and the ability to use water. So that, that could work there. Yeah. But is there any, uh, any um, indication that this is being used as a uh, uh, convenient way of adding to stream flows um, at the expense of farmers? Um, there's a number of, you know, I could talk all the rest of the day about the water issues to yeah. this industry. One company has got a license to discharge the water to the Condamine River upstream of Chinchilla Weir, and some water has got the approved government approval to sell that water to irrigators. Now, I will say this if I can, Ron, that irrigators have been on a, a decreasing um, water use regime for a number of years, and for a number of very good reasons too, I might add. In terms of groundwater out of the Conway alluvium, it was grossly over allocated in the 1960s and that wasn't a malicious act. That was because governments and the users didn't know and it became over allocated. And we now are paying a price for that over allocation. We've voluntarily surrendered 50% of our entitlement in an endeavour to make the resource sustainable. And it's the same with people that have access to surface water. We've all heard the Murray-Darling Basin debate, and there's a lot of issues around that that I don't want to get into here. But in general, agriculture has had a diminishing access to water in our region. And we don't argue about that because we see the need for it. But here comes a new industry that produces all of this new water and if that water doesn't replace existing use, our children and grandchildren will pay a high price for this industry. We're in a water challenged region. We can't afford to be pulling water out of the ground and tipping it into a river or creating a new use for it. But if we can do that, why has the government been taking away our existing entitlements if there's that much spare water in this region? Yeah, I, I, think, I think we'll limit the two, to two questions per speaker and then wait for the forum to do it. Thanks, Graham. You've given a fantastic performance. Uh, very succinct. Very well, uh, people.